What is up guys? I know what you came here for. You came here to watch me absolutely pick apart and destroy Dorian Yates' workout. Um, and you wanna watch because you wanna watch someone that is 100% less awesome than Dorian, um, has 200% less muscle, and is like a thousand percent less British try and pick apart his workout. And then you can tell me how I'm an idiot in the comments section. To which I would agree. There will be none of that soap opera drama stuff while I try and pick apart someone's workout that is not here, because I think that's kind of childish. Um, but I'm gonna go through a workout and I picked Dorian Yates honestly because Dorian Yates is probably my all time favorite bodybuilder. Um, not just from an epic physique that I can't relate to at all, um, but from a great approach. Um, from one, his work ethic, he's the embodiment of hard work. But in my opinion, he's also the embodiment actually of the, what really should be considered the ideal optimum era or optimal era of bodybuilding where he was a guy that had every single thing you would need on paper from work ethic and adherence and all the things that embody hardcore um, and the people that like the hardcore tend to focus on that side of him but completely ignore like direct quotes from him where he was a guy who was also um, doing things you weren't supposed to do uh, just because everyone else was doing it. even people that were bigger than him coming before him uh, he was a guy that was happy to think and do things differently and do some things again that were you know really mainstream this is what you did coming in the 70s and the 80s and this is how bodybuilding was and again he did a lot of stuff because he thought about okay well what is really the goal of this training thing breaking things down to smaller pieces and then figuring out what worked for him my workout reviews in general not just this one um, are going to be mainly positive things so let's focus on people that did a lot really well um, and let's see how we can translate that to you but also the thing I always want to acknowledge is that first whoever I'm going to review we know that it worked for him how do we know that it worked for him well look it worked for him, right? So that's one thing that really gets kind of overlooked, I think, now, where everyone is the smartest nerd and who can be the bigger nerd and who can draw more stuff. And again, I'm the nerd of nerds who likes to draw that as well, too. Um, but I also have the vast majority of my experience is actually training people in person. And what I'm looking at is what produces results. People forget that all this stuff you want to talk about, that's neat, but does it actually produce results? And when something does produce results, for an individual, you don't change it. Yeah, you can always think, could I maybe do this quicker? Could I do this with less orthopedic issues? And that's a great thought process, but there's really no debating if something did or did not work. Now, of course, everyone's gonna compound things. Yes, genetics are huge. Yes, PEDs are huge. So drugs make everything happen faster and have the end result higher, but drugs themselves don't just get a body part to go from tiny to huge overnight, right? So again, the actual you know stimulus still needs to be there. The recovery needs to be there. Again, genetics and drugs just amplify the effect and can speed along the results. But if you look at someone that's con consistently made progress over a long period of time, there's something you can learn from that person. So we're going to acknowledge that first off, everything that he did worked. Um, and then we're going to look at all the stuff that Dorian did and figure out, okay, well, what's some great stuff that he did, did long before other people that can also work for you in your training? How can we make your training better? Um, you know, then we're actually kind of breaking down. So what am I going to bring a little bit different? Cause everybody and their moms is doing workout reviews right now is I'm gonna draw, everyone's gonna be very excited. Y'all came here to watch me draw um, because I say in here, physics don't lie. And again, I could mess up how I draw the physics, so I could lie from being wrong. Um, but if we're actually drawing pretty well some lines of force and where his anatomy stuff is going on, we can actually break some of this stuff down and say, okay, well, here's why this works so well, or here's you know maybe some different options if you're not 300 pounds and shredded and all that kind of stuff. Um, so we'll look at some different options and draw on some stuff. One, if he has equipment that you guys don't have, what would be some options for you guys? You know, look at again, how did this actually apply to his body? And what are some concepts that we could say, hey, this is actually very similar to this thing or that thing. Again, where we're not saying everything that he did was perfect or the only way, um, but we're gonna acknowledge all the good stuff that he did and see variations of the things that worked really well. Cause that's the other thing I wanna clarify. I'm also not here to say, hey, everything did, Dorian did was perfect. So let's just follow it blindly because then we wouldn't be listening to what Dorian actually did himself. It's like he didn't just follow stuff blindly, he figured out what worked for him. And obviously if there's a difference between Dorian and I, beside my very scientific percentages of how much more British he is than I am, um, is that he was a professional bodybuilder. So the majority of his experience, at least first, came from testing and applying things to himself. Now I know he's actually gone on and he's trained a lot of people since he's retired, so I'd be interested to hear his feedback of how his thought process maybe has changed a little bit applying things to different bodies. But that's where my thought process is gonna be a little bit different as well. I was a wildly mediocre bodybuilder, um, but I'm a pretty okay trainer and I'm gonna have my thought process of, okay, I've applied lots of stuff to lots of bodies and how can we help 
you guys at home with this. Um, and so again, I kind of doubled down on this, but I'll just reiterate, when you guys see workout reviews from me, you know, hopefully I'll keep doing some of that clickbait stuff with the covers uh, so I can get some new people to come in here and they just want to watch, again, they want to watch a disaster like the daytime TV shows like Jerry Springer stuff where you just, let's just watch a disaster unfold. Um, you can go somewhere else to watch that. This isn't going to be me shooting fish in a barrel of just picking a workout that everyone that knows the workout's atrocious, I know it's atrocious, you're clicking on the cover knowing it's atrocious and just want me to make fun of how atrocious it is for 15, 20 minutes. I honestly think that has value because there's some newbies out there that really don't know any better and things like what celebrities do, what money and marketing can kind of you know, skew what maybe this actual motive of the stuff being shown, that has value. But that's not my area of expertise, right? People aren't following me to ask, you know, hey, is creatine good for you? Is it bad for you? Google, is creatine a steroid? How many grams should I take, right? That's not, that's not me. I'm, I'm here for, you know, kind of more of what I would consider higher level stuff. So if you're going to watch a workout review from me, it's going to be hopefully more thought provoking. Um, and mostly overall, a positive thing. Um, that we can gain from not just me making fun of people that aren't here to defend themselves. So I'm going to start with this epic Dorian quote. I'm going to leave it up here. So if you want to read this while I'm talking, you can just kind of zone out and listen to some better words because I'm not going to read it verbatim. But it's the, the first sentence, the first two sentences are really my favorite part about Dorian. It says, well, first of all, I should say I'm very studious. I like to study things. And he goes on to talk about how he read every single thing that he could find under the sun with nutrition, watched everyone's training, read about everyone's, this was different, he didn't have YouTube back in the 80s. Um, so read everything that he could, which would be the same thing of, you know, you guys sitting home obsessively and watching every single video that you guys, you guys have more access to stuff than he did. If Dorian was doing this right now, if Dorian was a teenager right now or in early 20s right now, I guarantee he'd be consuming every medium. He'd be reading stuff, he'd be watching stuff, all that kind of stuff. Um, and so again, that's the funny thing is so many people will literally point at Dorian and just say, oh man, just pick stuff up. Oh man, just lift weights. Oh, if something's moving, it's working. Like just try and point at Dorian and say that. And you're like, you're pointing at part, the one part that you saw, I see big muscles in him, you know, apparently picking up heavy stuff and just neglected all the other stuff that made Dorian, in my opinion, a lot better than other bodybuilders at the time um, and progress further than against someone else that could have been given him same genetics. He had great genetics. But again, he maybe wasn't structurally and from a muscle belly standpoint as blessed as some of the other guys that were around, you know, in the early and mid 90s. So if you want to read all through that, that's really, I'm going to, every time I review some of his workouts, we're going to get a, a quote in there um, as well of stuff that he said. Um, and again, that should be the big thing that obviously we're trying to figure out now with Dorian, look at his big giant muscles and we're going to watch him pick up heavy stuff while his awesome training partner yells at him. And I'm going to just sit and watch maybe the whole video straight and forget to talk for six minutes. Um, and just admire the awesomeness that is Dorian training hard and heavy and screaming and the sweet British accents. But at the same time, don't let that ever dissuade you from realizing that this end point that he got to came from a lot of thought process. Again, a lot of science, which is I'm going to read all this stuff. I'm going to start to apply some stuff to myself and then figure out what works for me. So the day that I picked to start with, you guys are going to know ahead of time, hopefully, is his blood and guts. If you haven't watched all of blood and guts, go on his YouTube, watch all of his blood and guts. I got to turn the sound on for some of this. Oh, it's so good. I love it. This is going to be the whole video. Best training partner of all time. Let's go again, Yates. Oh, man. So, first off, I just want to acknowledge, why does everything sound cooler when you're British? I mean, you sound smarter and you sound more hardcore at the same time. What do Americans sound like for everybody else watching this? It's like a bunch of dumb cowboys. We don't sound as hardcore for some reason, and we also sound dumber. Thanks a lot, American accents, wherever they came from. Uh, the best training partner of all time. I literally just want to, like, you know, just pay him to come and yell at me. Not just when I work out, just in various areas of my life, like when I'm parenting, um, in the carpool line, stuff like that, just to yell in British accent various things. But we're actually talking about exercise. I promise we're going to talk about exercises as well, too. So what are we starting with? We're starting with the Nautilus pullover. Now, to be honest, this is a tricky place for me to start with here um, because in general, there's this idea out there with overall I agree with that pre-exhaust is not necessarily a great thing. You know, and, and again, I'm not going to say that I uh, have listened to every single thing that Dorian has said and can quote everything he said verbatim. So again, if my interpretation here is off, my mistake, obviously not his. Um, but I think the thing that gets lost is when people will sometimes pre-exhaust, which what I would consider 
um, pre-exhaust with an inferior exercise before moving on to a better exercise. And what would be an example of that? Now, again, I'm going to say this, and someone's going to take this as gospel, and it's not because there's exceptions. But in general, if someone's quads work well, right, they don't have a hard time feeling them, you know, they don't have knee issues or whatever it is, you know, you ask Joe, would you start with a leg extension first or a squat pattern first that goes to full knee flexion? Personally, I would start with a squat pattern first. I always want to prioritize the mid to lengthen range. It's something I've been saying for a long period of time. And again, the science people will particularly say, hey, really emphasize the length and mid range. So again, I don't think it's bad to train the shortened range, but I agree 100% you should prioritize the length and mid range. Again, I'm not gonna get into that too much, but really the idea of that is, those are the ranges where I think you can produce the most intramuscular force. And that seems to be, of all other things, the main driver of hypertrophy. So I would say pre-exhaust, in that case, leg extension before you know, a squat pattern, people say the pre-exhaust is take out, you know, just to isolate the joint and take out the extra stuff. So the idea here is take out elbow stuff or grip stuff in a row or a pull down and just isolate the joint. But the thing that's different about the pullover is this trains the length in the mid range. So he's really taking his lat through the full range of motion here. So I'm going to say his first exercise selection here between the pullover and next he goes to a pull down. Would this be something that I have to say absolutely everyone should do? No. Um, would I ever tell someone not to do this, especially if it's working well for them? Uh, absolutely not. And I could make an argument for it too. So this trains through the length and through the mid range. So if we're looking through, oh, let's get a pen. This is what you guys came for. So if we look at the shoulder joint here, and we'll talk about the range of motion that he's going through here as well to kind of lining that up with the pad so we can actually see if we get through all that arm tissue, that's roughly where his upper arm is and his body's somewhere down around here. So if we're actually looking at what range of motion his shoulder's going through, it's right around there. Um, so if we look at that, this again, from a lat standpoint, this is the length and range. He's taking his elbows out of it and it's overloading that range. So it's obviously he's doing a ton of weight and not just doing this for like, some people like to pre-exhaust. So it's like, yeah, I like to do like, you know, three or four sets of 20 and they're all 20 reps short of failure. Again, I would say that's just a lot of extra fatigue that's gonna take away from what comes next and not necessarily something that's gonna be for an effective workout. But if you're actually training this and you're training it hard and you're actually training close proximity to failure, then I could say it would be effective. The other thing that I wanna note here is look where he's ending. So there's a lot of talk now, which is actually mechanically correct, that if you go all the way up here, you know, to full 180 degree shoulder flexion, you get to a position where your lats can't work as well. Doesn't mean don't go there, doesn't mean the pullovers that go there are bad, but basically if you do a normal pullover all the way from this stretch, all the way then down to here, the beginning is probably more pec, still some lats for sure, and then as you get further down, probably right about here, the lats get to a position where they can work a lot better. And then all the way through, they can work well. Well, look where Dorian's end here. He's staying away. He's probably a solid, whatever that is. I mean, that's at least 30 degrees short of full shoulder flexion. Now, again, I don't know what kind of mobility he has. He has so much tissue, he probably couldn't get there anyway. But I would also argue he's staying in a range of motion, even though it's a pullover, away from that 180 degrees, staying to where his lat probably actually is doing the majority of the work, is actually pretty lengthened. Um, and, and again, is not going past the point where his pec's taking over a whole lot. The other thing that I wanted to point out here um, is that he is taking it. Let's see if I can get a little bit better of you. I guess that's as good as we're going to get. He's tucking that arm all the way into the side. So when we come all the way down to the bottom, again, everything moves because that's literally how much, even aside from camera motion, the shoulder joint's going to move a lot. Like his torso is here, his upper arm's here. I mean, even from that, because I'm not quite straight from the side, it's actually probably pretty overlapping. So he's taking his lats through a full 160 degrees range of motion, and obviously he's challenging that. So now the thing that we're going to look at, and this is where people are going to get mad at me, but sorry, it is what it is, is everybody loves this machine. Everybody loves this Nautilus pullover. And I think the main, pe main reason people love it is because Dorian used it. But what we're going to look at here is the loading pattern here. And so again, if we're looking at the loading pattern, we have to find the axis. And we're looking to about a 90 degree from the line of force. So the line of force here is actually from, if you can't see the chain, what we have on most modern equipment is a belt. And that is the moment arm. So that is where it is in the stretch position. And as we go through to the short position, obviously some things have moved from a camera standpoint, but we'll compare the lengths of those, assuming the camera has stayed the same. So let's go back, we'll do the line of force. Sorry if we're nerding a little too much, but worth pointing out, in my opinion. We go back to blue. Let's look at the new moment arm. If you're new here, sorry, I talk about moment arms sometimes. So what does that mean? If we actually measured the weight in his hand or the weight in his upper arm where he's pressing, this machine is whatever the difference of these two is, whatever percentage it is. So let's say this is 30% longer than this. The load is going to be 30% heavier in his upper arm in that position. 
Now, is that good for lats? No, it's not really good for any single joint because you're definitely gonna be stronger in that length and through the mid range, especially for lats, not just from a length tension relationship, but also from a mechanics and internal moment arm standpoint. That's, this is external moment arm. So there's some nerd stuff for you, whole nerd salad, word salad. And as you come into this part, you're definitively weaker, again, from every standpoint, from a mechanical standpoint and from a uh, length tension, which again is how muscles produce force. So as awesome as this machine is, the cam's actually backwards. You would actually want the opposite thing. So you would want it longer through the length in the mid range and getting very short as it came to finish. Now, the funny thing is I actually asked my mentor who knew more about this stuff than I do. And I said, man, how did Arthur Jones miss the boat on this? And it's again, when he was the first person actually making cams and doing loading patterns, apparently, and I don't even know through the majority of his life, didn't have as good a testing to understand what is the body's strength in this motion compared to what we're trying to do from a machine standpoint. And I guess as he built later and later and later models and eventually went on to Medex, these kept changing and changing and changing. So I'm guessing his later models, again, the person that designed this, Arthur Jones, designed this Nautilus equipment, um, actually got to the point where he kept changing the models and eventually got it closer to arguably what that profile should be. So that's a little nerd standpoint. And so what does this look like in actual practicality as well too? What happens? I wanna point out, which I'm gonna keep highlighting here, Leroy is the name, I don't remember, I'll get, Leroy Nasty, I, everyone just calls him Leroy Nasty. What's his last name? Sorry, Leroy, I forgot. Best training partner ever. Aside from all the awesome stuff that he yells, watch how he spots. So what happens when you have something that's not a great profile? Watch how he spots him. So Dorian can complete the full range of motion. Why does Dorian fatigue where he fatigues? So he's doing the full range of motion. And then where does he fatigue first? Where can he first not finish the range of motion? Watch, here we go. Can't finish the end. Where is he spotting? Just at the end of range motion. Where does he spot this time? a little bit further up in the range of motion. So a little bit further lengthened through the, through the shortened position and last one, look how high he starts. And then all the way down through. So if you pay close attention and you wanna go back and see how much he has to spot him through to finish. So when I'm saying one, from a nerd standpoint, I'm explaining to you the profile of that, that you can all glaze over and say, Joe doesn't know what he's talking about. Well, then we can point at Dorian and his big giant muscles and show that his big giant muscles know what we're talking about. So when he first spotted him, you know, if this is the whole, I'm gonna see what the best way to draw this, but if this is the whole range of motion that he's going through, the first rep he put his hands on here and spotted him to finish. That means this portion right here, Dorian couldn't finish. Why is that? Because the machine is too heavy there, or if you wanna look at it, too light up here. Had he had more fatigue from that length and beforehand into the shorten, then he might have started to fatigue a little bit more evenly. In my opinion, fatiguing evenly through the range of motion is the goal, holy grail of hypertrophy. That's just not just my theory, but that's what I think. And then what happened, so he still had a ton of strength up here and fatigued even further up. Kind of again, from a length tension standpoint, you're weakest here, but you'll be able to produce more and more force through that length in the mid range. So the next rep, his hands came on around here. I don't remember if he did three or four force reps. And the next one, his hands came on up here because this is where you're gonna fatigue first and you could literally see the pattern. Even though he could do all of this, he needed assistance because he didn't have the strength left to finish the range of motion. So when you have something that has a bad profile, this is what it looks like. And it's not a big deal because they figured out without knowing any of that dumb, dumb stuff, Leroy knew when to put his hands on and how to spot him. And that's the difference between you know, a spotter in powerlifting where it's like, I can't do it and just pick, pick it up. Not saying that that's all powerlifters goals, but you know, when you're in, I'm in high school and I asked for someone to spot me on bench, it was to pick the bar up when I died. In, in bodybuilding, I think the goal of a spotter should be for the most part to make up for gaps between exercises and what your body is capable of doing. Um, and so again, if we're looking at what he did there, that's the quick way to overcome that. And this is also why hitting failure, when people talk about hitting failure or hitting task failure, doesn't mean the same thing for every exercise. It can't. So again, because this is the opposite of what he does, you're always gonna have the ability to do all those partials. Now, am I saying you have to do that? No, but it's not really because the muscle hit failure. It's because he hit failure because of the way the force is being expressed through this specific range of motion. Whereas if this exercise had been heavier, the cam was opposite. It was heavier from the start and lighter into finish. His last rep probably would have been unable to move or just a grinder through the entire range of motion instead of just needing it at specific spots. So what do we have next, a pullover? So arguably a teeny bit of redundancy, but you get some different stuff here. Let's look at a couple things here with the pull down. So one, where is his body position? Where is the shoulder joint? Where is his upper arm? How much shoulder flexion are we going through? So again, 
All the nerds are saying this now. Dorian had figured out, and I would agree with what the nerds are saying for the most part. Not to say it has to be this exact angle, so again, don't over-nerd on me. But going up here doesn't have a ton of merit. It's not bad, it's not wrong. Um, but again, as you start to go up higher, one, it can be an uncomfortable shoulder thing, so that's a rule and everything. Don't go there if it hurts. Um, but also, I think just from uh, where lats have effective leverage, that makes a lot of sense as well too. And what you'll see with this one's a little bit tougher to see, but as he completes reps, see if I can slow this down. Man, this is so, here we go, we'll get a good view from here. But as he completes reps, this is actually a good view from the side. There's a stretch component where that, now it's tough because the camera's moving, but you guys can see it. If we look at how he finishes these reps, again, so if this is the lat meet down here, so some of it comes from, this is what I mean when there's motion in the GH joint. There's the shoulder joint up and somewhere up in here. So technically we'd actually draw it, if I drew it better, we'll draw the shoulder, try and guess where the shoulder joint is amongst that meat. So some of the range of motion comes from, you know, where the lat is pulling on that bone. And then some of the range of motion comes from, let's see if I can get it the right way, this whole thing elevating. So the camera moves, so it's a really tough thing to see, but this angle didn't change a whole lot. So this angle changed a little bit, but what happened is this whole scapula lifted up in this direction. And again, if we just have these two points, basically origin and insertion, that elevation with a component of protraction as well too, further lengthen the lats. So again, if you're gonna do a pull down, you know, not only should you take, again, to somewhere around here from an actual GH joint standpoint, I think you really need that elevation and protraction and Dorian's getting both here. And then again, he just kind of lucked out a little bit with his hammer strength machine. So a couple things we're looking at here is one, Let's see if we can get it from here. So it comes across his midline a bit so that if you look at the handles here at the top, it kind of diverges at the bottom. Now this is even better for someone that's Dorian size in my opinion. So when you're coming to the top, if you want a little bit more of a stretch coming across the midline, this is slightly more stretch compared to this. And because Dorian's especially so wide, it kind of flares out at the bottom and it still lines up really, really well for his lats. So again, this is why I tell a lot of people, shoulder width look, works really well for a whole lot of people because sometimes as things diverge and they come out, if someone was very narrow on this machine, this might promote your upper arm flaring out a little bit more. And again, obviously if we're trying to bring those two points together, origin and insertion of the lat, that flaring doesn't help that happen at all. So one, this machine worked really, really well. Um, and then also it had a pretty good loading pattern, not to overly nerd, but where this, the weight here, is moving the most vertical, which I'll correct my verbiage from some of an old video. So basically where that is parallel to the ground is where the load in his hand is going to be heaviest. And so where is it happening here? It's happening a little bit more towards the length and the mid range. Now again, it's not, I, it's not perfect because again, he's coming from that stretch position. So when he's all the way stretched here, you know, it's a little bit shorter, you know, so it's moving, you know, to the point where the weight's moving a little bit more horizontal and not as much vertical. So not gonna have as much impact from gravity. But when he comes to the top, we're still getting this where even though we can't see exactly where the weight is, we know that um, this is gonna be much more moving vertical as it comes over the top. So it's still a pretty darn good pattern of probably heaviest around here and going lighter into this position. So it's a good profile. And he's got a little chest pad to support into as well too. So at the top, especially the weight's pulling more this way because it's an arc and he can press on that pad and make sure that things aren't moving. Now the thing again where the nerds and the meatheads like to fight about this one, which I think is a little bit silly. Like what if he didn't have this machine, right? So what if he wanted something that went from here to here, that went a little bit across his body and still let his upper arm tuck at the side? Because if lats is the goal, that tuck or finish at the side I think is important. So again, if you don't have that machine and you're right now, I'm out of luck, what's something you could do with that? You could do that with a cable. <laughs> And again, if you do it with two cables, what happens? Well, one, there's not a whole lot of cable setups where they could cross over, but the cables kind of bump into each other. It's a little bit of a pain in the butt. So you could do, God forbid, a single arm cable pull down. So that's one of the ones where I think it's kind of funny. Everyone likes to tear that apart and says, oh, this is, you know, if you're old school, if you're awesome. I mean, watch what happens right now. So right now, let's see, we got, we got a picture of Dorian. Right now, let's get a whole view in there. There we go. So right now, Dorian is very hardcore. Why is he very hardcore? Because his hands, are both holding something at the same time because that's the definition of hardcore apparently. Now what happens if this happens? Oh my gosh, we can't see this arm. What if he was only holding arm one, one arm at a time? Is that the thing where it's no longer hardcore? Oh my gosh, it's single arm. He's overthinking, he's a nerd. So I don't really know where these rules come from. So all that being said, is the single arm pull down thing or whatever, is that overly nerdy? Is that overly optimal? Is that not hardcore? I don't really know what any of that means. If you can set up a similar thing and it's not a huge pain in the butt, and if I ever saw somebody doing a single arm pull down and they had 200 pounds on the stack and they were doing it with pretty damn good form, 
odds are they're gonna have a big lap. So I get the notion if you've got a good machine, you've got things that set up and you can put plates on it, I guess that's the big thing as well too. This is a machine, just like a cable is a machine, but that's why meatheads like hammer strength because you can put plates on it. So it makes them feel like it's more of a free weight. It's not guys, it's a machine. By any weight, shape or stretch of the definition, it's a machine. So let's move on. So great exercise, so this is, in my opinion, if we're looking at Dorian's stuff here, this is just like the absolute perfect pull down for him. You know, the only thing that could be maybe the slightest adjustment is if it was a little heavier in that lengthened position, but even that's like, I give the profile here like a seven out of 10 as opposed to like a 10 out of 10. What's up guys, you may find this a little bit shocking, but I had a hard time keeping this one short-winded and this video turned into a beast, so stay tuned for part two.